this is a lecture about transport and the subtext about public transport and private transport. And I'm reminded of my friend David Hale, who is a very impressive Chicago economist. And David, um, flying across the Atlantic on Concord in the days when Concord still went across the Atlantic, found himself sitting next to Ivana Trump. And this was in the mid-1980s. Now, if you may recall that in the early 1980s, um, Donald Trump uh, went bust for 700 million. And his punishment, rather than being sacked, was to, stay, uh, was to be told to stay in his job and sort out the mess that he'd already created. And uh, that's an interesting way of treating people who uh, cost huge amounts of money. Anyway, the lovely Ivana, as she then was, said to David when she discovered he was an economist, times are tough. And I know times are tough because I have to travel by public transport. And David had his image of the beautiful Ivana on the New York sub subway system with graffiti everywhere and Kalashnikov toting gangsters. And then she carried on, normally when I fly the Atlantic, I fly in my own plane. <laughs> so public transport has different meanings to different people. Now, London is the only one of the major world cities to have been mainly developed, if you take the entire London agglomeration, in the age of the horse and cart. And what I'd like to do today is go through the transport needs. When London was developed and it needed more rapid transport, it had to be innovative. And so the Victorians and then the Edwardians and their successors created the world's first urban underground railway system. London is still a major world city, but needs now to cope with huge international economic change and with its own development. And critical to how it copes will be its transport system. My past Gresham lectures have showed that the world's greatest ever economic event, the industrialization of the emerging economies, is creating massive pressures for Western economies who've got used to operating on a high cost basis. It's also changing the structure of these economies. And I will highlight some of these changes before looking specifically at the role that transport can play within this and what benefits this might bring. I've argued that we cannot easily cope with the super competitive economies. And we should not just hang around waiting for their growth to slow. China's economic growth has already slowed uh, down as its labor force started to shrink. It shrunk by three and a half million people last year, which is quite a shrinkage if you think about it. But even the disappointing growth in the first quarter of this year in China was 7.7%, .7%, and the markets went down on that. Because of the cultural tradition, and I think also because the super competitive economies in Asia have learned from some of the mistakes that they believe that we've made. I think that the super competitiveness will stay dug in, even though some of its effects will erode over time. And of course, the flavor of some of the economies will adjust as economies like China, for example, move from being abundant in cheap labor and short of skills to having to move into a more skill intensive and probably higher paid uh, state of economic development. One of the consequences of the super competitiveness is it puts downward pressure on wages in the developed world. When the West had a monopoly of skilled labor, we paid ourselves reasonably well. Now our wages are under downward pressure and the demand from the emerging economies for energy, food and raw materials is putting up the cost of living, and both are squeezing household disposable income in real terms. And not only are disposable incomes per household down, but within that squeeze total, the costs of essentials are eating up a much larger share. So if 
the UK is to minimise the adverse effects of the rise of relatively low-cost competitor economies, we need to adjust our high cost of living in the West to something less wasteful and more affordable in the new competitive environment. My fourth Gresham lecture showed areas where this could be done for housing and energy. And this lecture focuses in more detail on an area that I know a little bit about, which is transport in London and what can be done to improve the performance and bring down the cost. Now, let me turn to the London economy. We live in an amazing London economy. Let me start first with definitions. Most international bodies define cities based on the World Bank definitions, which decide on the boundaries of urban agglomerations by when population densities drop below 400 persons per square kilometre, or the equivalent US definition, which is 1,000 persons per square mile, which is virtually identical. Now, most of us think of cities from a tourist perspective, and we think of the city centres, which are often historic. But from an economic point of view, the agglomeration is a more appropriate definition, and from a transport point of view, even more so. Now, in London's case, the official government region, um, the local authority definition for the GLA, and the sort of common sense definition, which is that London's what's within the Green Belt or within the M25, they all more or less coincide, and we're lucky in that. But quite often for other agglomerations, the local authority, government region, and, uh, 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 and agglomeration definitions differ considerably. For us, there's much less of a problem but we do need to be comparable when we look at other cities. And that's why I say that London is, by comparison with most other cities, a city that was designed a relatively long time ago. If you looked at, at a map of London before the age of the car started at the end of the 19th century, about 70% of it would look very familiar to someone who knows London well today. John Betjeman's Metroland was the only major development during most of the 20th century, although, of course, there were plenty of rebuilding after the war. Before the late 20th century and early 21st century, development of Docklands and East London. So most of London was developed before the age of the car and lorry. Many of its streets are extremely narrow and certainly not designed for large vehicles. Now, compare this with Paris. More than half of the Paris agglomeration was developed post-World War II. And even the centre was modernised by Baron Haussmann, who was the préfet of Paris between 1853 and 1870. And notably, he was responsible for the wide avenues, although this was not to improve transport, but to allow troops a straight line of fire in case of rioting mobs. But it does help Paris transport today when the alternative use is perhaps less required. Although I don't know with the French. Surprisingly, the lower Manhattan part of New York was planned by the commissioners in 1811, although only built up over the subsequent 50 years, and Central Park wasn't built until 1860. Although designed well before the age of the car, the specification of streets of minimum width 60 feet and some avenues of 100 feet suits modern tra traffic very well. But as with Paris, transport wasn't the aim. The aim of the wide avenues in New York's case was to act as a fire break and fire was a very real potential problem in those days. The fire of London had only happened for 150 years earlier. But of course most of the New York agglomeration was not developed until the 20th century. Beijing was the first city in the world to have a population of over one million people and was the world's most populous city from about 1600 until London overtook it in sometime in the 1820s. But again, if you go there, other than the Forbidden City, which doesn't have a transport issue because it doesn't have transport, um, and it's a mile square, by the way, you may think of it as just a sort of small tourist centre, but by God, it's a long walk. Um, and it can take up the better part of a week if you look at it carefully. Um, but other than that, uh, most of the main streets are now modern. London is a world city. It is the most cosmopolitan city in the world, and its predominantly immigrant labour force 
has created an impressive economic dynamic. Yet, uniquely amongst world cities, much of the London agglomeration was planned in earlier days when mobility was less and people did not expect to move around so much. I first got interested in the London economy when my father had the privilege of being the Lord Mayor of London, and that was before Ken and Boris, so the Lord Mayors actually meant something in those days. <laughs> I was then the Chief Economic Advisor to the Confederation of British Industry, and uh, my father asked me to provide him with some notes for his Lord Mayor's banquet speech, and being an obedient son, I said yes. And uh, I thought this was an afternoon's work. And in fact, it took two very long weeks of work because we discovered that most of the statistics did not actually exist. Now, things are better now, but it's still the case that local economic data is surprisingly missing in a UK that is becoming increasingly local. Among other things I discovered was the growth in the London economy post Big Bang. And... Uh, I called it for a while the Tiger Economy on the Thames. From 1990 to 2012, London's economy grew at an average annual rate of 4.4%, compared with an average annual growth of 3.2% for the UK as a whole, and rather less for the UK excluding London. But the city's days of leading the London economy have come and gone. The model of using money from the retail banks to finance investment banking and some of the racier end of city activities is no longer possible. And the money isn't there, and even if it was, it wouldn't actually be legal. The number of people working in city jobs has declined. We think the job losses have been about a third, although the government statistics suggest a smaller decline. Whether the jobs exist or not, the collapse in city bonuses is more definite. These peaked at 12 billion in 2008 and are now about 2 billion. I don't think I will say only about 2 billion because I think even 2 billion is a lot of money to most people. The collapse demonstrates the extent to which the financial sector has lost its leading position. And moreover, bankers have suffered some reputational damage which makes them scarcely less unpopular than paedophiles. In fact, some claim they're paedophiles at dinner parties because they don't like admitting they're bankers. I sense that the tide may be starting to turn. And of course, the country needs all the successful industries it can get. But the increasing critical mass of the Eastern markets in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Shanghai, amongst others, means that I think the city's not any longer going to be able to claim, post-2020, that it's the main financial economy in the world, and it will have to settle for the role of being the main financial market in Europe, although it will still be the world's leader in many specific subsectors of the city. When the city was doing well, not only was it expanding its number of jobs, but also because of the fabulous wealth and incomes that it was generating. Its knock-on effect through spending was huge. Our studies for Canary Wharf, and I'm glad Robert John is here today, um, our studies for Canary Wharf indicated a multiplier effect of four for financial service employment, which is about twice the normal number. But number, but now, the city has lost both its number of jobs and also some of its spending power. And of course, its dynamic is a bit less. And with interest rates and hence investment yields set to be low for a long time, the customary fees for fund management will, I suspect, be fees squeezed down over time, which will also have an impact on profitability. But London never ceases to surprise. Just as one industry loses its dynamic, another comes along to take its place. Britain has one of the most highly developed internet retailing sectors in the world and is also one of the world's leading online marketing economies. CBR is close to the retail sector. We work with all the 
leading retailers except Tesco, which is probably why Tesco's results haven't been so good recently. <laughs> and we've been tracking the move to online retail as it's happened. Britain's also a leader in online marketing. We produce the advertising forecasts for associated newspapers and the Guardian. It's the Daily Mail and the Guardian. You can't get more unbiased than that. As well as the strategic forecasting for B Sky B. And we've been tracking and forecasting the online marketing economy for some time. In 2011, online overtook conventional advertising in the UK. And it's the first country where that's happened. And what has emerged is a new digital economy combining IT, communications, online marketing and sales, and with a dash of cultural activities thrown in. My colleagues have christened this the flat white economy, either because the people live in white flats, or possibly because it's their most frequent coffee order, or maybe it's the colour in which their offices are decorated, or maybe a mix of the above. The new jobs are still driven and employ currently predominantly young people from all around the world. And the businesses are dynamic, although many of them have yet to achieve sustained profitability. In fact, many of them have yet to achieve any profitability at all. And so salaries are low, although there are promises of future remuneration through share options or profit shares. The businesses tend to co-locate near Silicon Roundabout at Old Street Station, which is coincidentally where CBR is based, in Covent Garden and Soho, and they've replaced some of the more traditional businesses uh, that used to be in Soho. So newer professions replace older professions. In theory, this type of work could be done at home, placing no demand on London's transport system. But actually, that doesn't take account of the way that the people who work in this economy live. Because residential property in London is very expensive, and because salaries in this economy, they're not city salaries, they are much, much lower. Economies tend to share flats and they have very little space to work from home. They go to their offices not just to work, but often to shower and to eat. If you look at Bloomberg or Google, you'll find that probably the biggest space there is the free staff restaurant. So that's why people go to travel to work in these circumstances. Now, this economy is creating spin-offs all around London, as well as in the rest of the UK. And London's employees, the number continues to rise by about 50% in just under 40 years, which places a huge strain on the transport system. One of the consequences of this continued economic success is that London subsidises the rest of the UK economy. Even after taking into account the fact that public spending on transport in London is much higher than elsewhere in the UK, Londoners still pay relatively more in tax and receive relatively less in spending relative to GDP than anyone else in the UK. After adjusting for the country's overall deficit, the net subsidy from London to the rest of the UK amounts to one pound in five that is earned in the capital, about 20% of GDP. So there is still a pretty large dependence of the rest of the economy on the London economy. The increase in employment has been matched by increased travel in London. Now, the heading of this, this is taken directly from the Transport for London statistics. The heading covers a table that has lots of numbers in it, but is illegible if you try and put it up on the screen. So I've just put up the summary percentage changes, which is why the title says 1993 to 2011, but the percentage changes only go from 2001. But what you can see is this increase on the right-hand side. The bottom right-hand number is the increase in total trips in the last 10 years. Now, actually, Transport for London has done a pretty impressive job in providing the capacity to match this growth. If you look at rail and underground DLR on the left-hand side, rail is up 41.9% over the 10-year period, underground DLR 13.5%, bus, including tram, up 59.7%. So those are the figures. The other interesting, spectacular growth figure here 
is cycling, which is up by two thirds, allegedly. I think it's up by more, actually. So there's been impressive growth in the provision of public transport. And London now has an enormous number of buses. According to the Singapore Land Transport Academy, we have in London nearly 8,000 buses. There are 6,000 working at any one time. New York, which covers a much wider and more populous area, has only 4,500. And even Beijing, which is an emerging economy still, and you'd expect it to have many more buses, has about the same ratio of buses to population as we have in London. Now, this shows the volume of travel in London and shows that private transport still does play a major role. And if you look more carefully, the line on the far side, and actually the colours change, the, 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 the wadge on the far side shows that actually the single most widely used mode remains the private motor car. 34% of all trips. Now, it's quite interesting to see how the different income groups uh, have a slightly di different dependence. Um, the lowest income group walks a lot and uses buses a lot. The highest income group actually walks about the same amount as the lowest income group, but much more than the people in the middle. But the highest income group does have a great tendency to use individualised modes of transport. It uses uh, motorcycles by uh, more than double the average, and they use cars too by about 25% more than the average. Because of the shape of London's economy, there is a crit critical tax dependence on the higher income groups. If you take the over 70,000, which is quite close to the 75K or more, which was the top income group covered by Transport for London, they actually pay more than 60% of London's income tax. So we do have quite a dependence on these, I guess you can call them movers and shakers, but the people who, the, uh, the high net worth individuals in London, and who tend to want to use more individualised form of transport, and who tend to have the sort of crucial meetings that they need to get to quickly. So we do have a slightly different distribution of income in London from where we have elsewhere in the UK. And this is a group that does need to be taken into account because of their importance for the London economy. The other issue that we need to look at in London is cost. Very roughly, the cost of buses has doubled. Now, there's been an increase in service provision. You've seen there's a 60%, 66% increase in, the, in bus usage but the cost has gone up more than proportionately. And tube fares, according again to the Singapore uh, 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 Academy, uh, tube fares are roughly double those in most other major urban economies. So the price of good public transport, and we've got a big improvement in public transport, has been partially bought at high cost. Transport for London have now got an impressive program of cost reduction and are starting to manage these costs down. And they've achieved significant first steps in making these savings. So I think they have some credibility in their claim that they are going to manage their costs down so that their operating subsidy will largely disappear. But that program needs to be extended if we are to be able to provide the mix of high quality and relatively low cost transport, which we're increasingly going to need. Now, one of the other things that we've seen is road management where there are some interesting questions to be asked. I should point out that the majority of transport economists see controlling road demand as, which is car usage essentially, as happening through controlling car ownership. Now that reflects the traditional relationship where the costs of having cars, about two thirds of ownership and one third usage. But last year was the first year ever 
when the cost of car usage in the UK, if you believe the RPI statistics, had overtaken the cost of purchasing a car. So usage costs for the first time became the predominant cost. That means, I think, that we need slightly to adjust our ideas to focus more on controlling car usage than simply on trying to prevent car ownership. Now, the next thing to look at is what's actually happening to vehicle usage in London. Now, this I'm afraid I've lifted from the TfL report, so I apologise for the legibility. The main thing you need to know is the bottom line is the one that gives the latest position in terms of what they think has happened to vehicle usage in London, which is that it started declining in the late 1990s and has been declining ever since and in total is about down by 10%. What this chart shows is how this splits for the different areas of London. And the lowest line, which shows that there's, uh, is for central London, shows that the decline in the number of vehicles in central London is more than a fifth since the year 2000. And that's obviously partially associated with congestion charge. Now, Transport for London have got some quite interesting GPS data, which uh, they re report on. And this is the chart that shows what they say. Now, if you think it's difficult to interpret, don't worry, I thought it was difficult to interpret too. And I had to sit and stare at it for quite a long time before I worked out what I thought it was saying. And if anyone's got a different point of view, you're very welcome to it. But my, my interpretation of this is that traffic speeds have remained roughly flat over the period since they started collecting the data, which is uh, a six-year period. Um, and that is slightly borne out by the data that we have on congestion, which seems to say that this is the congestion study that we did for the uh, 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 the inf uh, for the information company uh, INRIX and uh, this is, these are the cities it covered and this is what it showed and what it shows is that in 2011 the average vehicle in London stayed absolutely static in um, traffic jams for 66 hours a year now, using traffic jams as a way of regulating traffic usage makes appalling economic sense. It makes rotten environmental sense too, because not only do static vehicles create the very worst kinds of pollution, but of course it's all very concentrated. We need to do better than that. The INRIC study showed a cost to London of 1.9 billion euros from the effects of stationary traffic. And that's not taking account, of course, of the vehicles, the cost from vehicles moving slowly. So we have a puzzle because traffic volumes are down, and in the central London case, quite sharply, but congestion has not improved. The congestion charge has not reduced congestion. Now, Transport for London, in their latest report, um, say that they've actually looked at this. And the critical phrase is the middle one. From the late 1990s onwards, however, traffic levels began to decline, and TfL established that the primary reason for the continued reductions in traffic speed, which would otherwise have been unexpected given falling traffic levels, was a substantial increase in interventions that reduced the effective capacity of the road network for general traffic. In other words, what their own report says is it's TfL's own actions that have caused the traffic jams. Now, I assume that the spin doctor, you can see this is section 412, who in normal circumstances would have been expected to read through this, clearly got bored long before he got to section 412. 
because I can't believe that they let this slip out uh, after the normal sort of scrutiny that you apply to public documents. I bet when this lecture is published, that guy will wish that he'd move job more quickly if he hasn't already done so. Now, a picture saves a thousand words, and this is the uh, front cover of the report that, to which I referred. And I'll show it a bit more closely in close-up. Now, you'll remember I pointed out that a third of all traffic movements in London were pri private car. This is the cover of what TfL thinks of him as important in transport in London. You can see a Boris bike, you can see a train, you can see a bus, you can see DLR, you can see a taxi, and there is a car in the background somewhere there. Uh, you can see a tram, you can see a minibus, you can see people walking, and you can see a tube. But the only car in there is hidden away in the background. And I think that tells you how TfL sees its priorities. And not entirely surprisingly, um, TfL uh, has got bus lanes, which are interesting, but are sometimes not the best utilised bit of road space. So, that is where we are at the moment. So, what can be done to make transport in London better, cheaper, and enable it to cope with the pressures that are going to be placed from growing employment? First of all, I think we need to have a new roads authority for London that is charged with maximising the benefits from the roads in an ideology-free way and ensuring roadworks and construction minimise their negative impact. TfL cannot run the road system and provide the bus services. They do the latter very well and are planning to do it even better. They do the former badly. Because of their focus on providing buses, they seem to ignore the other demands on road space, whether for cyclists or for cars, or indeed for lorries or for vans. The new authority needs to be charged with the priority of keeping the traffic moving, making good use of bus lanes, managing the cycling strategy, which creates the tragedy of people being killed, on, particularly on arterial roads, and with some better ideas than simply putting a cycle lane on the west way. Building underground roads where they're economic and sensible. I know some people disagree, but then you know, you're on one side, Jeremy Clarkson's on the other. Um, I'm somewhere in the middle. There is private investment available to build underground roads, and these can match the new age where you will have driverless cars, and where actually private transport and public transport start to get more similar. If you start to build a new underground road system, it can start to cope with the pressures of electric vehicles, with charging points, um, and with uh, uh, pick-up from the road, and it can also start to cope with the new era of driverless vehicles, about which Alistair Heath wrote so eloquently in the press this morning. The new body should also regulate London's roadworks and ensure that those who block London's road system for unnecessarily long are heavily fined. The same system could be used to ensure that there is a strong financial incentive for one utility to use the roadworks of another when they need to perform essential maintenance. When you get the road dug up twice within a few months, uh, unnecessarily, it does seem to be not the most effective use of road space, which is scarce. Construction work that affects road usage should also be monitored. It may be possible eventually to introduce time movements for heavy lorries in the same way as it is already done in Canary Wharf. The other part of the strategy has to be to build on, actually I'll go back, has to be to build on TfL's past success and support its continuing uh, uh, programme. 
Currently, TfL has a program for cost reductions building up to savings of about two billion a year by 2017-18. This program needs to keep going for another 10 years at least as it incorporates innovations such as driverless trains. Remember, tube drivers get paid more than Ryanair pilots now. Increased volumes and loading factors from growth in transport, particularly growth in public transport, should be major positive benefits in terms of reducing costs. Meanwhile, we need to have an extensive programme of new investments for rail and underground that is also required. Crossrail 2, which is the latest name for what used to be the proposed Chelsea Hackney line, is a priority, as is on an even earlier time scale, the Northern Line extension, which has, in theory, been approved by the government, but you normally need to be approved about 20 times before something actually happens. On the road work, uh, network, rationing by price is going to be necessary. Economic congestion charging should be the quid pro quo for giving motorists more control over the roads that they have already paid for. And these charges should accurately reflect the economic costs of different road, modes of transport and their contribution to congestion. Receipts from such charging should not in general be available to subsidise other modes of transport, but there are circumstances when that is appropriate. Now, one area where traffic management might be able to improve congestion in London is by reducing the size of vehicles in London to suit the scale of London streets. Too many vehicles have expanded to the very maximum permitted by the construction and use regulations, which were not designed for this purpose. Buses, lorries, four by fours, they all get wider and bigger. To no one's benefit, it's like going to a football match in the old days when you had to stand and someone takes a soapbox. And so everyone else takes a soapbox to try and see over everyone else. In the end, you're all standing on soapboxes. No one's any better off except the guy who's selling the soapboxes. Well, to some extent, that's the game we've got into in London. And if you can't use regulatory measures, then taxation measures ought to be applied to try to discourage the use of excessively large vehicles. Now, we've done some analysis of the benefit of the underground roads, and they're shown here. This shows the potential employment benefits, another 120,000 jobs, this shows the GDP benefits, uh, which potentially six billion to UK GDP, the vast majority of which is London. And the spread of the benefits in employment terms is more concentrated in the central areas, but of course that's where people more tend to work. The benefits, if you base it on where people live, are much more widespread. So if you go through the benefits, we reckon there's four billion in cost reductions uh, sitting around to be achieved. We reckon the gains from underground roads are about six billion, mainly to London GDP from the complete system, um, which are taking roughly as a proxy for household incomes. We think the net benefits from improved tube and rail scaled from Crossrail to be about a couple of billion. Quite a lot of the people who use buses do the do so for free. Now, I'm about to get my free bus pass on the 24th of June this year. I'm part of that transitional generation as they raise the age from 60 to 65, and so I get it somewhere in the middle. Um, I don't think that uh, we're drawing free bus passes for older people is a clever idea, but I do think that one ought to be a bit careful about the use of concessionary fares. Um, one, people shouldn't be subsidised uh, massively to use transport. So there is an issue about managing uh, bus usage by pass, by price. And there are other things. Boris Bikes, uh, evening standard claim, the five-year cost is £225 million, pounds, of which £50 million comes from Barclays' subsidy. Now, there are currently 7,000 bikes and there are planned to be 9,000. So even if you average on the, on the 9,000 bikes, that's um, £25,000 per bike. And £25,000 for one bike is quite a lot of money. 
Um, I reckon that um, the system is going to be costing uh, Transport for London about 40 million a year, which against a total spend on cycling of all kinds, last year of only 80 million, does seem an interesting use of resources. I'm not going to pretend compared with these large numbers it's fundamental, but I think it's an indication of what has been a slightly high cost, if high profile, issue. So these are the sorts of numbers that we think. Now, when I started preparing this lecture uh, a year ago, I set myself a target of trying to identify improvements that would be worth a thousand a year per household. The rough quantifications we've added up suggest a benefit of about 4,000 a year. Now, they all won't happen at the same time, and some will happen more slowly, etc. So, all I can say is I think I've at least hit my target, and maybe we can improve on the target. Now, anything that's worth that much deserves consideration. And I submit, ladies and gentlemen, that that's my case. Thank you very much for being so attentive.